Sophisticated. These are the warships that have been the backbone of the world's great naval powers. In the deep waters of the open oceans of the world, bigger is better, and size and strength go hand in hand. Empty and vast. The open sea has required fleets of large ocean-going ships to sail on it and to control it. In these roles, the large ships of the world's navies have served their countries well. But there are some jobs where bigger isn't better where size and sophistication can be a handicap rather than an asset. Jobs like those found in the shallow inland waters close to shorelines and in the muddy estuaries and narrow inland channels of the world's rivers, places where big ships simply cannot go. These inland waterways are oftentimes just as vital for a Navy to control as the sea lanes in the open oceans of the world. These are the haunts of the gunboats, Small and lightly armed, gunboats can go places and do things that big ships would find impossible. Performing roles like patrol and blockade, clandestine operations and rescue, gunboats are fast, maneuverable, versatile, and can deliver a powerful punch. Despite their small size, gunboats have played a critical role in naval conflicts throughout the 20th century. This program is about three of those conflicts. A fierce riverine battle in Vietnam's Mekong Delta. An international incident centering on a U.S. gunboat in China. And a daring PT boat rescue in World War II. In each of these conflicts, the impact of the gunboats was crucial. China during the 1930s was a country in turmoil. Beset by internal decay and the unrelenting pressure of foreign imperialism, it was a nation torn by civil unrest, violence, even all-out combat between competing local warlords. And yet a steady stream of commerce with the rest of the world continued, much of it passing through the great port of Shanghai at the mouth of the Yangtze River. Protecting America's share of that trade was the mission of the USS Panay. She was part of a tiny fleet of seven U.S. gunboats charged with defending the lives and property of Americans along the length of the Yangtze. This force was known as the Yangtze Patrol. July 7, 1937. Using a skirmish between Chinese and Japanese troops as a pretext, the Japanese launched a full-scale invasion of China. In a lightning campaign that began in 1931, Japan had already conquered the resource-rich northern province of Manchuria. Now the Japanese were bent on securing new sources of raw materials to support her growing industrial economy. International opinion turned against Japan, and she was denounced around the world. But in the United States, the isolationist tendencies that had set in after World War I still held sway over the American public. I would adhere closely to the advice of Washington. No entangling alliances 
express are in plan. Meanwhile, the Japanese juggernaut continued to roll forward. After taking Shanghai on the coast, two Japanese columns drove inland to launch a coordinated attack on Nanking, which was then serving as the capital of China. During their march, the Japanese split their forces in an attempt to cut off any retreating Chinese troops. Though she was completely outclassed by the powerful Japanese forces in the area, the little 450-ton Panay was dispatched to Nanking to offer whatever protection she could to the Americans trapped in the war zone. While Japanese ground forces closed in, Nanking was subjected to the most intensive aerial bombing ever seen up to that time. of Nanking had begun. Thousands were killed and thousands more were put in jeopardy. For the Americans among them, the Panay was the only hope of a safe refuge. As a neutral vessel, she was, in theory, immune from attack by either side. Once on board, her passengers could be taken out of harm's way until the fighting in Nanking subsided. December 11th, 1937. With the Japanese at the gates of the city, Lieutenant Commander James J. Hughes, captain of the Panay, decided that the time had come to rescue all the Americans remaining in Nanking who wished to be evacuated. By this time, several foreigners had swollen the small contingents that had gathered at the U.S. Embassy compound. Comprised mainly of businessmen, journalists, and embassy personnel, these people were among the last Westerners left in the city. Included in the group were several top flight war correspondents, men like Norman Soong of the New York Times, Jim Marshall of Collier's Magazine, Colin McDonald of the London Times, and Sandro Sandri, a reporter for the Italian newspaper Stampa. Also on board was newsreel cameraman Norman Alley, who along with the others would record the final days of the Panay and report them to the world. As artillery fire began falling dangerously near the Panay, Commander Hughes decided to move his vessel upriver. Steaming in convoy with him were three standard oil tankers who wanted the Panay's protection as they escaped to safer waters. Along their journey, they were observed by Japanese troops in the area, troops that were commanded by Colonel Kingoro Hashimoto, an extreme ultra-nationalist who hated colonialist Westerners, including Americans. After an overnight stop at an anchorage just above Nanking, the Panay dropped anchor at a spot 27 miles upriver from the beleaguered city. Hughes believed that his little convoy would be safe here. The date was December 12, 1937. A group of reporters was below decks playing poker, and as the cards were dealt, Jim Marshall said he felt lucky. Only minutes later, at 1.35 p.m., 24 Japanese warplanes swooped down on the Panay and the tankers, unleashing a torrent of bombs and machine gun fire. Norman Alley raced up on deck to find explosions erupting on every side. We were all frozen with shock for a moment, he wrote. Then before we could recover, another bomb exploded. Norman soon ran for his cameras, bullets and shrapnel whistled through the air. Several men were wounded, including Italian reporter Sandro Sandri, whose side was ripped open by a bomb fragment. I'm hit, Sandri yelled. They were the only words anyone was ever to hear him speak in English. After half an hour, 17 hits and near misses had been scored by Japanese bombs. The tiny Panay was reeling. Lieutenant Commander Hughes lay wounded by a bomb blast. Assuming command, Lieutenant A.F. Anders, who was unable to speak due to a neck wound, grabbed a piece of chalk and scrawled on the deck, leave ship. Even as the crew kept the Panay's eight machine guns blazing, the most severely wounded were loaded into the boats. By now, however, there weren't enough undamaged boats to evacuate everyone on board, so some of the uninjured had to swim for the shoreline over one mile away. 
Even as the Panay was being abandoned, the Japanese planes continued their relentless attack. Norman soon reported in the New York Times that those still aboard watched in horror as one Japanese plane dove and machine gunned a boatload of wounded. Now defenseless and nearly deserted, the Panay was left littered with the debris of battle. Bomb fragments turned her once gleaming superstructure into a pitted mess. Almost an hour after the order was given to abandon ship, the last boatload of men was ferried from the shattered hulk of the Panay. The Panay wasn't the only casualty of the afternoon. The tanker Mei Ping and her two companions were left aground and burning by the attacking Japanese as well. The fires were described by Colin MacDonald as sending huge sheets of flame and red-hot fragments of metal flying into the air. The five officers, 54 men and 15 passengers of the Panay now sought refuge on what MacDonald called a desolate stretch of mud bank. As Marshall said in Collier's magazine, we all did our best to help care for the wounded. While they did, the rest of the survivors came ashore and took stock of their situation. Many of them were still in a state of shock from the attack. With their wings looking to McDonald like the fins of sharks about to attack, Japanese planes circled menacingly overhead. Undeterred by the threat, Dr. C.G. Grazier, who was medical officer of the Panay, organized the efforts to care for the wounded. Finally, at 3.54 p.m., the Panay sank. It was exactly two hours and 20 minutes since Jim Marshall had said he felt lucky. The survivors feared they would be attacked by the Japanese troops they had seen in the area. But many of the 16 wounded were injured too severely to move quickly. Fortunately, enough medical supplies had been brought over in the last boat to provide at least some basic care. But for Italian journalist Sandro Sandri, there was nothing that could be done. Within hours, he would die. Lieutenant Commander Hughes was comforted by one of the American businessmen he helped to save. The rest of the men, including Chief Quartermaster John Long, who was wounded by the same bomb as Hughes, waited for the severely wounded to be made ready for the journey to safety. Colin McDonald reported that the following night was like an evil dream of the primitive. The group wandered blindly through marshes and freezing temperatures before they finally reached the small village of Hosien, about eight miles away. The Chinese villagers feared what the Japanese might do to them in reprisal, but they still helped the Americans with food and what medical care they could provide. When word of the attack reached America, their reaction was swift. An outraged President Roosevelt instructed Secretary of State Cordell Hull to deliver a strongly worded note to the Japanese ambassador demanding a full explanation. The Japanese government was caught completely off guard. As far as they knew, their pilots had standing orders not to attack any shipping in the Yangtze in fear that it would belong to a neutral country. They scrambled to come up with an answer to Roosevelt's demand. Meanwhile, the ordeal of the Panay survivors was far from over. They spent two more anguished days and nights wandering through the Chinese countryside, evading what they thought were hostile Japanese searches. Soon related that the feeling of being hunted was too much for the man's high-keyed nerves. Finally, they got word that a U.S. and a British gunboat were on their way to rescue them. Making their way back to the river, the Panay survivors were soon on their way to rendezvous with the gunboats. Once back in Shanghai, the wounded were taken on board the cruiser Augusta, flagship of the U.S. Asiatic Squadron. By now, the Panay incident was headline news around the world, and hordes of reporters photographed the survivors' every move. Also taken aboard the Augusta was the casket of Chief Petty Officer C.L. Ensminger, who died during the journey. Ordinary seaman Edgar Hulsebus died later, bringing the Panay's death toll to three. In an effort to calm the inflamed mood of the American public, the Japanese offered a complete apology through their ambassador to the United States, Hiroshi Saito. Eventually, they paid an indemnity of over $2 million for sinking the Panay in the tanker. But their explanation of the affair was, and still is, hazy. 
Officially, the attack was the mistake of a group of overzealous Japanese pilots who took the Panay and her convoy to be Chinese troop ships, despite the Panay's clear U.S. markings. But most evidence suggests that it was a plot by the fanatical commander of Japanese troops in the area, Colonel Hashimoto. He almost certainly had been alerted to the presence of the American convoy. And it was his headquarters that originated the misleading report that the Panay and the tankers were actually Chinese troop ships. Hashimoto is believed to have provoked the attack in an effort to start a war with the hated Americans. This charge, however, has never been proved. Whatever the cause of the Panay bombing, its effect was quickly felt. The American public was shocked and angered by the written and filmed accounts of journalists Marshall, Soong, McDonald, Alley, and others. The isolationism that had gripped the nation in the 20s and 30s began to lose its hold, and America was awakened to the potential threat posed by Japanese aggression in the Far East. As a result, the U.S. Congress expanded America's naval shipbuilding program. Though this measure failed to ensure American readiness against the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor four years later, it did mean that U.S. forces were in a far better position than they would have been otherwise. Even though she was sunk, the little Panay had sparked an international incident that affected American military strength on the eve of World War II. March, 1942. The Japanese tighten their stranglehold on the tiny fortress island of Corregidor at the mouth of Manila Bay. Along with the U.S. and Filipino forces dug into the rugged Bataan Peninsula just a few miles away, the troops on Corregidor represented the last vestiges of American resistance in the Philippines. The Japanese were determined to wipe them out. General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the U.S. and Filipino resistance, had become convinced that the situation was hopeless. So too had the top Allied leadership. They made the decision to evacuate MacArthur from the beleaguered island. The Japanese commander, General Homa, suspected that the Americans might attempt such a mission. He knew full well what a propaganda triumph it would be if the legendary MacArthur were rescued from the jaws of certain defeat. Homa ordered Japanese forces to redouble their efforts to subdue Corregidor. Meanwhile, MacArthur had made the decision to leave the island, but not on board a submarine as his staff had advised. Instead, he chose to leave on a tiny PT boat. MacArthur believed these swift, 65-foot-long torpedo boats had the speed and maneuverability necessary to thread their way through the Japanese blockade. Everyone else but the chances of success at one in five. The roots of this daring mission went back several years. It was 1935, and the Philippines, which had been an American possession since the turn of the century, were about to be granted their independence. In Washington, President Roosevelt met with Philippine President Manuel Quezon to sign the newly ratified Philippine Constitution. With the signing by the President of the Philippine Constitution, we have witnessed the birth of a new nation. The people of the United States and the people of the Philippine Islands have been conducting together a great experiment. And during the period of the Commonwealth government, this experiment will continue. In recognition of the importance the United States placed on the defense of the Philippines, Roosevelt dispatched General MacArthur to be the military advisor to the fledgling nation. MacArthur had just finished a term as Army Chief of Staff and was America's most distinguished soldier. Now he threw himself into the task of training the joint U.S. and Filipino forces that would defend the island. Situated as they were astride the shipping lanes that linked the resource-rich countries of Southeast Asia with the rest of Asia and the Pacific, the Philippines were of enormous strategic value. This fact was not lost on the Japanese, who saw the conquest of the islands as a vital first step towards unlocking the riches of southern Asia. Located less than a thousand miles to the north of the Philippines, Japan possessed the most modern army in Asia. She also possessed one of the world's largest navies. Defending against Japan's naval threat, 
was a particularly difficult challenge for MacArthur. His plan was to build a fleet of PT boats to do the job. The PT, or Patrol Torpedo Boat, was developed by the U.S. and British Navy starting in 1937. The need was for a small, fast craft that was seaworthy enough to operate on the open ocean and which possessed the offensive firepower necessary to attack the largest ships afloat. Thus, the torpedo was employed as the PT's main armament. Using their small size and the cover of darkness to conceal them, standard PT tactics called for the boats to steal within launching distance of the enemy vessel, then let fly with their torpedoes and speed away to safety. Since the Philippines could not afford to build a conventional navy to defend itself, MacArthur saw the relatively cheap PT boats as an attractive alternative. Fast and hard-hitting, PT boats would be perfect for hit-and-run attacks against an enemy invasion force in the sheltered waters of the Philippines. December 7, 1941, Japan began its drive to conquer the Pacific with a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. A few hours later, Japanese planes rose from their bases on the island of Formosa, only 300 miles away from the Philippines. Their targets? American naval and air installations on the islands. The U.S. air base at Clark Field was demolished, shattering American air power in the Philippines. Then the Japanese Navy moved in to support landings by ground forces. MacArthur's PT boats struck back, but only nine of them had become operational. Far too few to make a real difference. Japanese forces overwhelmed the ill-prepared Filipino defenses. As the Japanese drove inland, MacArthur withdrew his forces into Bataan and Corregidor, hoping to hold off the Japanese until reinforcements arrived. But those reinforcements never came. The situation looked hopeless, and President Roosevelt made the decision to evacuate MacArthur to Australia. MacArthur himself picked Lieutenant Commander John Bulkley to command the mission. That bold buckaroo with the cold green eyes, as MacArthur called him, commanded the last operational squadron of PT boats in the Philippines. He was charged with leading a formation of four boats through 560 miles of Japanese waters and then delivering MacArthur safely to an airfield on Mindanao. It looked like an impossible task, but Buck Bulkley believed he could pull it off. By Wednesday, March 11, 1942, all was in readiness. He had assembled all his generals at North Dock and none of them knew which ones were going to be selected if they knew there was going to be a, a breakout. And they lined up and MacArthur went down and designated which ones would accompany him in my boat, the PT-41. Having made that distribution, we set off and through the mine minefields. We went south to Lubong Island and very close to that island there to avoid about 22 Jap ships are out there waiting to catch us on the blockade invaded them, but there were fires. There could have been fires from burning cane fields. I don't know that. But I thought there were fires alerting the Japanese that we were at sea. Japanese coast watchers had spotted the little flotilla and were trying to alert Japanese forces on the larger islands. If they were successful, Japanese planes would be searching for Bulkley's squadron by dawn. To avoid being sighted again, Bulkley turned his boats away from the islands into the rougher waters beyond. Now the high seas began to take their toll. According to R.G. Kelly, skipper of PT-34. Big foaming waves 15 to 20 feet high thundered over the boats, drenching everyone topside. The PTs became separated, and Bulkley was forced to take three hours to search for the other boats. He failed to find them. At daybreak on Thursday, he called off the search and pushed ahead on his own towards the nearest alternative hideout. All during this time, 
MacArthur lay on a mattress below decks, incapacitated by seasickness and the depression brought on by his defeat in the Philippines. Sometime after dawn, Bulkley's PT-41 arrived at Cuyo Island. Within a few hours, two other boats straggled in. At 2.30 p.m., the three boats stopped waiting for the missing PT-35 and set off on their own. They would learn later that the missing boat had broken down. Its passengers made their own way to Melbourne later. Fifteen minutes after they left Cuyo on the last leg of the mission, one of the lookouts on PT-41 yelled, Sail ho! Looks like an enemy cruiser. And that's exactly what it was. If they stayed on their present course, the PTs would cross right in front of the enemy warship. Bulkley immediately took evasive action. After a few tense minutes, the cruiser disappeared over the horizon. The little PT boats hadn't been spotted. I think it was the Whitecaps that saved us, Bulkley said. The Japanese didn't notice our wake, even though we were foaming away at full throttle. The boats continued on their way all through the next night. At 7 the next morning, they arrived at Cagayan Point on Mindanao. Astonishingly, after 35 torturous hours at sea, they were coming in right on time. As MacArthur got off the PT-41, he turned back to Bulkley and said, Bulkley, you've taken me out of the jaws of death, and I won't forget it. Then he turned to an aide and asked where he could relieve himself. If there's going to be an evacuation by a boat, and it could be no evacuation by submarine because of the, the, the heavy coverage of the entrance to Manila there by the Japanese ships, there's no aircraft available whatsoever. <clears throat> May have been one or two old broken down ones, but that was certainly not what the general was going to take. The genius of MacArthur was very simple here, that no one would expect, and certainly the Japs there, you'd use a PT boat or a torpedo boat to make the break out. And uh, high speed, so that was a sheer genius there, and he is the guy that suggested that. Once he was safely on Mindanao, MacArthur was flown to Australia, where he immediately began planning to retake the Philippines. to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Yeah. Tonight, I repeat those words. Yeah. I shall return. Yeah. MacArthur's words were to be a rallying cry for Allied forces as they drove through the South Pacific towards the Philippines. And it was MacArthur who led that drive. He was the one who convinced the U.S. High Command that recapturing the Philippines should be a high priority so they could be used as a staging base for an eventual assault on Japan. And it was he who successfully employed the leapfrogging amphibious tactics that pushed his forces forward at such a high rate with so relatively few casualties during the campaign. Finally, on October 20th, 1944, Douglas MacArthur waded ashore on the Philippine island of Leyte, fulfilling the promise he had made two and one-half years before. Within another year, he would stand on the decks of the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay to accept the unconditional surrender of the Japanese Empire. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. MacArthur's rescue had, in fact, changed the way the war was fought. Bulkley and his PT boats had paved the way for a major shift in Allied strategy in the Pacific. Nude hostile actions 
against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. In the mid-1960s, America's reply came mainly from airstrikes flown from the large fleet carriers stationed off the coast of North Vietnam. Because of the carrier's ability to sail deep behind enemy lines, the air bombardments were highly effective. They would continue to be throughout the war. However, as American involvement escalated, the Navy found itself inadequately prepared to wage war in the shallow waters of Vietnam. Crowded coastal inlets where North Vietnamese junks laid mines and smuggled vital supplies to the Viet Cong were ill-suited to the large ships of the Blue Water Navy. Even more important were the sprawling waterways of the Mekong Delta. Fanning out from Cambodia, the eight branches of the Mekong River crisscrossed most of South Vietnam. The Delta's lush alluvial plains were home to a third of the country's 15 million people. In addition, the region produced 70% of South Vietnam's rice. For these reasons, the Mekong Delta was of immense strategic importance to both sides during the war. Traditional forms of land transportation were virtually useless here. Boats and sampans were the main mode of transport, and waterways were their roads. For centuries, these twisting streams, canals, and marshlands provided a vast network for travel, commerce, and industry. The Mekong also provided excellent routes of infiltration for the Viet Cong during their guerrilla campaign in South Vietnam. Being familiar with the unique conditions in the Delta, the Viet Cong used its labyrinth of waterways to their advantage. Moving quickly to a target, they would strike hard, then melt back to their bases in remote marshy areas that were immune from attack by U.S. ground forces. In order to combat the Viet Cong's tactics, the Navy would have to control the 5,000 miles of inland waterways of the Mekong Delta. To carry the fight to the muddy waters of the enemy, the Navy would have to invent new tactics, new weapons, and new ways to employ its fighting men. And the whole operation was to hinge on a tiny fiberglass-hulled patrol boat that was barely 30 feet long. In early 1966, an ad hoc fleet of World War II vintage landing ships sailed into the estuaries of the Mekong and chugged upstream through the broad river channels. Each of these refurbished LSTs, or landing ship tanks, was to serve as a floating mothership for a group of 10 patrol boats. The U.S. Navy dubbed its plan Operation Game Warden and called for volunteers to fight its inland war in the Delta. Men came from all segments of the Navy, boatswain's mates, quartermaster and radarmen, even cooks and clerical rates. These sailors were to man the patrol boats that would serve as the backbone of Operation Game Warden. These boats were brand new craft, designated PBR for Patrol Boat River. Modeled on existing pleasure boat designs, their fiberglass construction and water jet propulsion allowed for high speed and shallow draft. But that's where the resemblance ended. The new PBRs featured a crew of four. Twin 50 caliber machine guns up front a single 50 caliber with a coaxial grenade launcher aft. Communications gear and surface radar. By January of 1968, a force of 250 PBRs had joined with other ground and air elements of U.S. riverine forces to effectively fight the Viet Cong in the Delta to a standstill or so they thought. By late January, the PBR patrols had become routine. Eight men in two boats and 12 grueling hours on the river before returning to the mother ship. 
But every sailor knew that even the most ordinary patrol could erupt into a deadly battle at any moment. You are about to witness one of those battles. Although it is a composite of many different engagements, it is representative of several actual conflicts fought in the Mekong Delta during this period. The date was January 31st, 1968. The Vietnamese Lunar New Year's holiday of Tet was beginning, and the entire country was preparing for the traditional celebration. But for the sailors on board the PBRs, it was business as usual. And that business was hunting for the elusive Viet Cong. The sailors' attitude was positive, almost cocksure. Said the 29-year-old captain of one PBR, when we catch the Viet Cong on water, he's in our element. His is the dark and the jungle. If he ventures into ours, we'll get him. Just as on any other patrol, the main activity of the PBRs on this day was stopping and searching local sampans for enemy contraband. Operations like these had made the PBR patrol successful at choking off the flow of Viet Cong supplies up until now. Crew members developed an eye for detail that helped them choose the boats they would search. Said one, first thing you look at is a man's hands and feet. If the nails are cracked, then he's probably a fisherman. If his hands and feet are in good shape, you know he's been wearing boots and carrying a rifle instead of working with his hands. So he's either a deserter, draft dodger, or VC. These searches were always tense for the PBR crewmen. They never knew which one might explode into a sudden firefight with the hidden enemy. This time they were lucky. No Viet Cong soldiers or supplies lurked inside this sampan. With the gift of chewing gum, the boat was sent on its way and the PBRs resumed their trek upriver. As the day wore on, the tropical heat and humidity became stifling. The boredom of the long patrol mixed with the ever-present threat of danger to create a unique kind of tension. One that could wear out a crewman's nerves as well as his body. On this day, that tension was even worse than normal. Boat traffic was unusually light as if the local population knew something was about to happen. The PBR crews could almost feel the enemy watching and waiting on the banks of the river. Suddenly, in the vicinity of a local village on a branch of the Mekong, all hell broke loose. A hail of recoilless rifle, rocket-propelled grenade, and machine gun fire erupted from the banks of the river. The PBRs accelerated to their full speed of 30 knots and let loose with their own armament. But the enemy fire was too intense to deal with on their own. As one PBR crewman put it, ambushes were a way of life on the Mekong. But this was no usual Viet Cong ambush. It was a full-scale attack in battalion strength. The PBRs fought back for as long as they dared. Then they turned away toward the safer waters in the middle of the channel. At the first sign of trouble, the PBRs had radioed for help. Back on the mothership, their urgent cry for assistance had brought immediate action. The two Navy manned UH 1 Seawolf helicopters based on board were scrambled for takeoff. Designed to support the PBRs during just such emergencies, the Sea Wolves could be airborne at virtually a moment's notice. Within minutes, they were speeding toward the battle. Meanwhile, the hard-pressed PBRs were fighting back as best they could. Communicating directly with the Sea Wolves, the PBRs guided them to the main concentrations of Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. 
Using their fixed and door-mounted machine guns, the Sea Wolves made their first passes at the enemy strong points. Seventy-six millimeter rocket fire lashed out to pulverize the Viet Cong. By now, more PBRs had rushed to reinforce the original patrol. As the battle raged into the night, it became obvious that it would take more than the PBRs and the Sea Wolves to drive the Viet Cong away this time. It was now clear that the enemy forces engaged in this battle were only a small part of a huge countrywide offensive that was hitting targets all across South Vietnam. Not long before, the U.S. High Command had assured the American public that the Viet Cong were on the verge of defeat, that victory was at hand. The Tet Offensive proved them wrong and irrevocably changed the American public's perception of the war. But these larger issues didn't matter to the men on the PBRs engaged in this conflict. They had a battle to fight and to win. The next morning found more help coming in the form of the mobile riverine forces attached to Operation Game Warden. These were army troops embarked on Navy landing craft that could be dispatched upriver to attack enemy infantry concentrations when the situation called for it. As they boarded their craft, these troops knew they were in for stiffer resistance than they had ever encountered before. They had heard the news about the enemy offensive and now they were heading right into the teeth of the battle. The flotilla of armored troop carriers was escorted by heavily armed monitors to provide fire support. At the battle scene, the monitors opened up with 81 millimeter mortars and 40 millimeter cannon, smashing the enemy at the point of attack. The troop carriers moved in to land U.S. forces on the flanks of the Viet Cong. Meanwhile, the PBRs used their extremely shallow draft to move in close to shore and soften up enemy positions along the riverbank that the monitors could not deal with effectively. The Sea Wolves, too, continued the assault from the air. Landing on either side of the Viet Cong, the ground troops caught them in the jaws of a classic pincer movement. The intensity of the battle grew as more and more U.S. firepower was brought to bear. Slowly, the tide turned, and the enemy was driven back from their positions. The PBRs and Sea Wolves were now used to cut off the Viet Cong's escape routes along the canals behind the enemy positions. Finally, after hours of hard fighting, the battle was won. Overwhelmed, the guerrilla forces were forced to either flee or surrender. The Tet Offensive would continue for 72 days. Militarily, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese were defeated. Politically, however, the results were far more ambiguous. But for the PBRs and their crews, this action in the Mekong Delta was clear-cut. Though greatly outnumbered, they and the Sea Wolves had held the enemy at bay until superior U.S. forces could be brought to bear. The tiny PBRs and their crews had lived up to the unofficial name that had been coined to describe them from the initials PBR. Proud. Brave. Reliable. The requirement for gunboats did not end with the war in Vietnam. As John F. Kennedy, who commanded a PT boat in World War II, observed, the need for small, fast, versatile, strongly armed vessels does not wane. In fact, it may increase in these troubled times when operations requiring just these capabilities are the most likely of those which may confront us. 
In the future, advanced vessels such as the hydrofoil and the surface effect ship will give gunboats even greater speed than the PT boats of World War II and the PBRs of Vietnam. Guided missiles and rapid-firing cannon will supplant torpedoes and machine guns, increasing the range and power of the gunboat's offensive punch. But whatever form the gunboats of tomorrow may take, they and the men who sail them will remain a vital part of the navies in which they serve. <laughs>